Good afternoon, everybody. Sorry we're running a couple minutes late today. We um, had a few technical difficulties, a few internet connection issues, I think. Um, but we're up and running now, which is great. Uh, I'd love to welcome Carol and Greg from Design Business Council today. Um, we're fortunate enough that they've agreed to join us and talk about project planning and pricing. Um, hey, guys, how are you doing? Very well, thank you. Awesome. Hi, Patty. Hi, everyone. Thanks so much for joining us today, guys. Um, you've been, uh, you guys, tell us a bit about yourselves. I mean, you're, just, you're essentially creative business consultants. You guys specialize in helping design studios run their businesses better. And you, you stream time yourselves, I understand, but you are experienced in a whole number of different tools and help um, all sorts of different businesses in the creative sphere to operate. Um, do you wanna maybe just talk about what you guys do, how long you've been doing it for and your experience? Yeah, you can do that. Oh, okay. So uh, the uh, Design Business Council we set up about 13 years ago. Yeah. Uh, what we recognised was that you know we had some really world-class designers in Australia, but uh, unlike uh, places like Europe and the US, uh, there was no real business management uh, training for those designers either at university or once they'd left university and started business. Um, so we took what we had learned from our 20 odd years of running a design practice and converted it into a whole lot of workshops and uh, online material and nowadays doing a lot of mentoring face to face. Um, and that's that's more or less where we're at at the moment. We run, run some breakfast sessions in uh, Melbourne and Perth and hopefully in Sydney next year. Uh, we're, we're running a regular series of workshops around the country for designers to use LinkedIn uh, and we've got our business of design week coming up in November which is a series of master classes in one week um, so yeah that, that's more or less us so basically awesome. we, we designers don't go broke through being bad designers they go broke <clears throat> because of um, we're not taught business practices mm. um, and that's it's interesting because I myself have friends who have been to university they've studied design and nowhere at that point in their you know university experience are they taught these essential things which they don't realize they even need to know like you know it's it's even business 101 but there are some things which if you're not told uh, or not even explained to then you're not even going to know where to start with them so um it's awesome that you guys are able to kind of you know patch that gap in the industry and be the support tool that um uh, so many people and businesses out there need Great. Uh, and today we're going to take a special look at planning and pricing. So we're kind of splitting the session up into two halves. Um, Carol, I think you're going to uh, tackle the planning side of things. I am. Um, fantastic. And Greg is going to give us some tips on pricing um, yep. in the back half of the session. Now, before we do get underway uh, chatting through, I'll just do some short housekeeping. So we've got a uh, a chat window on the right hand side there's quite a few of you here today everybody thanks so much um, for showing interest it's definitely a testament to carol and greg i think um so please say hello introduce yourselves let us know who you are where you're from uh and i understand that carol and greg did a little blast out in their email chain so if you're not using stream time as well let us know that if this is your first time uh talking to us the team here at stream time then it'd be great to hear that too and um, we can, you know, always chat later. But uh, yeah, so say hello. If we do have questions as we go, uh, Carol and Greg will be able to answer a few of those towards the end of the session, I think, uh, which is great. Um, and we're going to aim to keep this session to about 30 to 40 minutes today. So we'll try to keep it nice and succinct and not get too carried away. <laughs> um, but without further ado, I suppose let's head in. Um, talking about planning projects, Carol, I mean, you've been doing this for years, so... A little time. <laughs> a long time, yeah. So where do you start when planning a project? Okay. Um, I think planning is all about... It's, it's quite logical. It's all about breaking it up into bite-sized chunks because the more granular you can be, the more detailed you can be in the planning, the easier it is to get the job done. Okay. So in the, in the planning... When you break it down, it gives you all sorts of benefits, like, <clears throat> pardon me, it makes it easier to cost because you can identify all the different sections. It makes it easier to delegate because you can mm -hmm. see the tasks in front of you. It makes it easier to schedule. Um, and I noticed your email with that phase 
um, Patty, we'll have to go through that because I don't use that. I tend to use the items in the yeah. job, so that would be really good. And it also, one of the attributes, I've done a little bit of about burnout with Andy, and yeah. one of the things that they um, identified with burnout is people get burnt out when they, they're losing control. They feel like they've lost control. So planning things in great detail is one way of gaining back control because you can see exactly what, what needs to be done. Mm -hmm. And also my absolute favourite is the, the smaller the task that you um, itemise, the more you get to cross things out when they're done. The more you yeah. can go home at the end of the day mm -hmm. and have a few things that you've you've crossed out and you've achieved. And that's always a good thing. So, you know, the easiest way to eat an elephant is bite-sized chunks. I think there's there's so much in there you've just said, Cal, that I wanna, I wanna tap into. And I think even, you know, when it comes to having a more granular list of tasks, and it, it's a matter of you know, rocking into the studio and knowing what you need to do that yes. day, right? As yes. opposed to having to actually figure that out as a task itself. Uh, yes. if, you start, if you start with the granular task and planning, uh, then that's going to make life much easier in terms of getting a job done and actually ticking those things off, as you just said. Yep. Um, now, two other things that you mentioned in there. One was uh, the phases, which we'll take a look at in a bit. I thought we released that this morning. Um, wow. so it's, a, it's a new feature update, so very timely that uh, we're able to show people well, that's today. I don't know it. <laughs> it's I'll, show you, I'll show you how it's working and what it's all about. But that's certainly going to assist us in terms of setting up a project and achieving that more grand, greater granularity. That was our response to one of the things that people were asking for was people wanting to just get closer to the work that needs to happen on a job. Phases is one way that we're, we're helping people do that, which is something that we're excited to uh, announce that we released today. And the other thing that I want to mention as well is the work that you're doing or that you have done with Andy. So for anyone who isn't aware um, or know who this Andy guy is that we're talking about, He's our managing director here at Streamtime, Andy Wright. He also uh, created Never Not Creative, which is an industry community for creatives, looking at some of the issues that exist within the community and trying to get some action or trying to look at some solutions and have conversations about these things, identifying problems. And a big part of that is mental health, understanding that there do tend to be prevalent issues of mental health in the industry and understanding the source of that work often comes from pressure and, you know, burnout and feeling out of control at work, which is exactly mm. what you were just talking about, um, Carol. So it's interesting to kind of see how that link then relates to, you know, something as simple as planning a project with more clarity and granularity can actually... Absolutely, just take control. control. And that's a good segue into the, the next bit that was... Um, Pardon me, understanding roles and responsibilities because part of, um, you know, a really good project is all about communication and yeah. part of the communication breakdown can be, I thought you were going to do that. Now, I thought you were going to do that. So mm -hmm. if you clarify the roles, who's accountable, who's responsible right at the very beginning, it means that everyone knows what they need to do. They know, they know with whom they need to do it. They mm -hmm. know by when they need to do it. Mm. They know who they're reporting to, and better than that, they know who they can go to to ask questions. So that means if it does go pear-shaped, that there's a process in place, there's a hierarchy that you can go to and you can get it back on track because yeah. you know many projects will go off track at some stage. So that roles and responsibilities is really good, and it's good because you can manage expectations, and that's the major problem with... Um, many, many projects is managing the client expectations and managing the team expectations as well. Yeah. So as you said, there are situations where things don't go to plan. You might underestimate how long a particular task takes and what's the best thing to do in those situations? How do you go about managing those expectations or at least readjusting or realigning those expectations? Well, part of it is to have that, that um, regular and frequent touch points. So some of the studios that we work with have a um, stand-up meeting. Like we had um, Charles talk at one, Charles Lubsha talk at mm. one of our breakfast meetings, and he has a stand-up meeting every single morning where right. everyone goes through what are the challenges, what are the block blockages, yeah. um, what's going to stop us doing the best we could possibly can. And he yeah. works a, a short, productive day, so it's really important everyone can get in and do what they need to do really quickly. Yes. 
Um, I went out to August and I spoke to the guys there. They have mm. 11 o'clock in the morning meeting because they've got a lot of part-timers and that's when they overlap. So it's, yeah, it's making sure that everyone knows there's going to be a time when they can um, collaborate, they can work out what's the problem and then how we can how we can fix it as a group rather than taking on solo. That's really interesting. And I recall, I think it was from the, the Never Not Creative Burnout event that you were just actually talking out in Sydney as well. Um, I think was it Paul there who was talking about how he actually works alongside his clients when they're trying to deliver on a project. That's they right. work very, very closely. And that situation I think was very specific to his business and the way mm. that they kind of operate with their clients. They just have that natural relationship. Mm. But he he brought that up and addressed it as something that people would often, you know, like jump at that or like, you know, be terrified. Like yeah. Mm -hmm. believe that people would actually work that closely with their clients because there there can be that added pressure of the client knowing like where the project is truly at right mm -hmm. what's actually Absolutely. happening That's closed the transparency doors. and we've also had other clients who's let they let their client into their job management system so they yeah. can see exactly where the job is so um my MO was to start the day sending emails out to all of my clients saying this mm -hmm. is where we're at this is what um, you can expect today. If it's not today, this is why it won't be today. This is tomorrow. So my thinking was I can help them plan their day. And the worst case scenario was letting them call me to say what's happening with this job. I always try to get in first and manage that, you know, those expectations. Yeah, yeah. Um, <clears throat> just circling back quickly to the granular project planning that you were talking about before, Carol, you you know, we we want people to be as clear as possible. And, you know, one one great instance of that um, that you mentioned before, Charles and how they work there at Love and Money, uh, they, they use stream time too. And I remember a conversation we had with those guys a while ago where they kind of explained how granular they wanted to go with their tasks. Their business model is so interesting because they work on slightly reduced days, but their efficiency is so, so high because they probably do have that, you know, style of workflow where they're able to identify what needs to happen and then, and then produce an outcome. But is there a point when granular project planning can become inefficient, do you think? Um, I think that it can be inefficient when people are paralysed with, what is it called? Your analysis, yeah. paralysed by paralysis analysis. by analysis. When yeah. they, they spend right. so more time planning than they do do doing. Yeah. Um, yes, you can go into it in more, too much detail. Okay. Um, <clears throat> one of the other things I wanted to touch on was the delegating because designers mm. are not great at delegating. We all mm. want to keep it all to ourselves. But doing that granular planning at the beginning means that you can identify which tasks you don't actually need to do or which tasks you can get a specialist in. <clears throat> to do rather than you do. So mm -hmm. in my case, when I was doing annual reports and I did that, um, I did the planning, I could identify if I had maybe 30 um, directors that all needed contouring, I could send that off to someone. If I had um, one of the energy um, ombudsman reports I used to do had 54 graphs every year and right. they all look the same, I could delegate that to someone else. So you can, break the task up into bite-sized pieces really easily because you've got that um, you've got all the tasks laid out and you've got the schedule so you can delegate them with confidence knowing that you don't need they, those back for a week you can go on and do the rest of the job around it I suppose you could say it's about working smarter not harder in those instances absolutely. and being able to chop up the parts of the job and knowing who's the right person for them Absolutely. And, and I find, I think, scheduling anything that's uh, less than 15 minutes is counterproductive. And I think that's where you, you get into that overload if you're putting in too many very short tasks. Um, the, the planning side of it just uh, takes over. So yeah. when you're breaking it down, if you're looking at it and saying, well, you know, that, that is actually just a two minute task. Well, that's not something that you yeah. have to break down in that granular form. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Great. Well, maybe this is a good opportunity for me just to show 
some people these phases that we've just introduced and yep. uh, explaining how they might be able to assist in the structure of a project. So if I'm going to share my screen quickly. Now, there's a good chance that a few of you have already seen that release of phases that we did and have already gotten the chance to take a look at it. For anyone that hasn't, um, we'll look at it now. So this is our job in stream time. I can see here I've got everything planned up at the top and then we start to see these items here. Now, for anyone who might not be familiar, items are the deliverables on a project or they're essentially the places where we can price a job and track time. So uh, this discover, this discover is pretty broad at the moment. It, that might almost feel like it's a phase of work in itself. And um, what we could actually do now because we've introduced phases is almost shift this up another level um, because we've got 50 hours through our discover phase. But as you can see, I actually have down here my sub items, which is almost like a checklist of things that I might need to do in that discover phase. There's some research and there's some exploration. There might be a whole bunch of other things. But with phases, I could add discover as a phase in itself. And I can see here, I'm just clicking in. It's kind of sitting here just above this item. And what it's allowing me to do is group multiple items together. And it's going to give me the total at the top here. So I can say, well, instead of this being discovered now, I might just call this one research. Mm. And what that allows me to do is then get a lot more clear about what I might need to look at in the research and even include these in sub items here. So to replace this with um, I'd, oh, identify market friends, for example, yeah. and on and so forth, you get the gist of where I'm going with that. Now, exploration might be the next item we can add here, and it could just come in down the bottom. Exploration, I could plan hours here. So let's say 20 hours there at 150. So I can now drag this one up and add it to my discover face. Sorry, that's just gone right to the top there underneath that research. And I might amend those hours to 30. So I am being a bit more granular with where this time mm. is going and more specific about what's happening when. Now, concept development might be my next phase and so on and so forth. I could split up the work that needs to happen underneath that concept development, um, just like I've done with this discover phase. So that at a very, in a quick snapshot is showing us how we could use phases yep. to get a bit close to the work that needs to happen on a project, um, which is great. So do phases come in in the schedule? They don't at the moment, but okay. it's something that we're interested in. This, the introduction of phases has yeah. set us up for uh, what we're talking about introducing soon, which is going to be a job timeline. And that would sit at the top here. You'd be able to scroll across and look at a job timeline. And what that would do is over you know, a time period, a, a timeline essentially, just see the phases of work and the items that belong to it kind of all pulled out together. Nice. And the, the idea is that that would be shareable with the client too. So yep. we're interested in getting that transparency around where we are today and where the project is planned to be based on nice. the job plan that we've got. So um, that's that. Yeah. I'll, stop, um, I'll stop sharing my screen there and in terms of planning, Carol, was there any were there any other points that you wanted to add? Um, look, the only just to add to delegation. Um, yeah. One of the good things about planning is being able to cost it really thoroughly, and yeah. and Greg will talk more about that. But sometimes designers don't want to delegate because they don't think there's the budget in it. Yeah. But if you break the job up into bite-sized pieces, it could be that you could actually delegate out some animation or the graphs or the contouring to a specialist who will do all of that in an hour, masking much smarter than I'm ever going to do sitting at my computer, and I can plug that back in. So yeah. and just have that. It's okay to have a few expenses on the job, I guess is what I'm saying, that the, totally. the expenses can be, you know, I cost myself out at $200 an hour, that person might be $120 an hour, and they work faster than I do. So you can get a markup, and you can get that job out on time. Absolutely, and pass it on to the client as well. So yeah, absolutely. Fantastic. Um, that plays in nicely to uh, what we'd like Greg to maybe talk to us a bit about, which is pricing projects. 
And we caught up yesterday, Greg, and you had plenty of really interesting thoughts, which I'm looking forward to, to hearing again and having you share with everybody here today. Uh, but when it comes to pricing, maybe you can kind of talk to us about how you feel teams should be pricing nowadays and where that shift, where why that's maybe different to why people have traditionally priced the way they have priced. Mm. Um, so, yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, the, the, um, the way I look at pricing nowadays is that, that we've sort of unpacked the six levers that operate in a design business and pricing is just one of them. Um, but all of these levers interact with one another. So pricing interacts with productivity. Um, yeah. If you've got a, somebody that's low in productivity, you're actually going to have to price out higher in order to make a profit from that person. So there's all these levers that need to interact. But the, the interesting thing that's happening, I think, in pricing nowadays is more and more people are costing their job out uh, based on hours and then they park it to one side and don't actually say anything to the client about the number of hours, but they, they um, uh, then do an estimate based on value where they'll look at the job and say, look, uh, it, it's actually worth this much for the client and that is way above what I might price it out at or cost it out at rather on, on an hourly rate. Um, and it's when you think about it, it's it's a logical way to go because designers that have been in in a business for or been doing design for you know 10, 15 years, they've built up all this expertise that allows them to operate much more efficiently in one hour than somebody who's only been around for five years. So uh, you've got to have that value factor put into it. Um, that, so there's, that's on the, the designer side. Then when you look at on the client side, you need to say, well, what is it that the client perceives as, as the value of this um, task that they're, they're setting you to do? And it's there that we go off and we start to look at, um, as one of our colleagues did recently, they, he looked at uh, an accounting firm, looked at the hourly rate that the accountants charge themselves out at, and then converted his quote to the same hourly rate, um, and it came out nearly double what he would have normally quoted the job at. Uh, yeah. Then at the estimate, and the client didn't even blink at it because they looked at it and said, "Oh, well, that amount of work it looks at, you know, it, 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 it's it's roughly forty hours, and at forty hours we would charge this much." So thinking of the time value in the client's terms is one way of valuing it. Um, the, the other way is you can get a whole lot of research nowadays uh, when companies are producing products. Mm. Uh, you can get an understanding of what their profit margins are uh, through uh, some of the industry research that's around. You get an idea of just how profitable these businesses are. Um, mm. And then if you're working with them, for instance, on a rebrand, and the aim of the rebrand is to actually increase their sales, um, by getting some sort of uh, indication of what sales increase they're seeking, mm. you'll be able to understand what sort of dollar value they're looking to get from the rebrand. Um, mm. That then puts a completely different perspective on it. Um, and so you, you would cost them more in terms of the sale value that the client is going to get. So that, yeah. that's one of the big changes that's, that's happening in the way uh, people are costing out projects. Um, uh, certainly in estimating to the client, I would steer very clear of all the tasks that we've just talked about, um, all the process stuff. I would steer clear of talking about that with the client. Uh, I think, number one, clients don't really understand what concept development is. No. Um, if you say project management, they think of themselves as project managers and they understand it from their perspective. But yeah. if you talk about artwork or digital artwork or uh, you know these the terms that we commonly use clients don't understand them anyway so well, I maybe would, aren't interested in no no all they're interested in is the outcome so when when we talk about those things like concept development we're actually talking about an output something that we're going to produce that we will then explain to them the reality is all they're interested in is the outcome how many more bums am i going to get on the seats yeah. Um, how, how many more widgets am I going to be able to sell? That's the outcome they're after. Yeah. So yeah. 
I think we should be explaining our estimates in those terms, which then, of course, links very directly to the whole value proposition. Um, and, and so the two things work hand in glove, the explanation um, and the, the, the value that you're putting on it. Um, I, think, I think that's so interesting, that shift in the gear of, you know, something as simple as the way you think about what you're delivering or at least the work that you're doing in, you know, putting in value terms and thinking even further and, you know, contextualizing that specifically in the client's environment is, I found that the effect that that can kind of have on your, you know, on your bottom line and mm. or at least the rates that you sell it for is amazing. It's incredible. Um, and, you know, each, the thing is with the work that actually happens, it ends up being delivered in all sorts of different contexts that do have, you know, pertain to different results. For example, one client, the utility of the work that might be done might not have the same reach as another client, as you were saying. And by being able to articulate that to the client or at least identifying that yourself, I think that's a real first step in shifting the gear of how you how you think about the work that you're doing, which is really compelling. Um, there was another thought that uh, someone was talking about recently, and I'd be interested to hear your your you know thoughts on this. Was the the idea of licensing intellectual property? Have you guys heard of that? You know that way of pricing or valuing work, or do you have your own opinions on it? You can. <laughs> we, we have opinions and experience in it. Um, yeah, and, and look, it's a vexed question within the industry is is to mm. how you actually uh, value your IP. Um, yeah. What I think is not understood. Uh, partly in the industry and definitely in clients, is that a lot of the IP uh, that designers have exists embedded in the files. So if you're, if you're really smart with InDesign, and I've seen guys who know how to get in and more or less program InDesign with a whole lot of um, glyphs and after styles and things. Uh, one guy very proudly told me he had a 500 page report he spent uh, 10 minutes pouring the, the, the word file text into it right. um, and he'd set it all up. Then he went off and did some gardening for an hour <laughs> or, um, while the, the machine crunched through it all. Um, so there's a lot of intellectual property there that would obviously be of value to a client to get their hands yeah. on. Mm. So I don't think clients quite comprehend that and I think a lot of designers don't stop to think about it either. So right. there's... That, that to me is the real intellectual property. Um, gotcha. The design itself, I think you have to hand over the intellectual property in the design to the client. And I can't see why you wouldn't because you don't want to reuse it for somebody else. That's not yeah. what designers do. Um, so handing over the design is not an issue. It's, it's more the intellectual property that sits back behind it. Mm. Um, you know, the way you build an Illustrator file or the, the, the layers you put into Photoshop and the smarts that you can put in there to make it very easy. Um, they're all the things that I think form intellectual property um, that have a value to the client, particularly if they've got an in-house studio and there's mm. more and more of that happening. So, so our thinking has changed yeah. completely since from when we started, you never handed over files. Now, it, the... The files are just a tool that what we're doing is selling strategies and solutions and, and business solutions. And the, the, um, the InDesign file is, is just a tool. There's so, mm. many, um, so many designers that are working with in-house designers where the in-house studio may get the out of the external supplier to come up with the concept and then the in-house studio will roll it out for um uh, to save costs, you know, for um, economic reasons. Mm -hmm. It's all about communication again, asking the mm -hmm. question right at the very beginning, mm -hmm. Do will you want my file? Mm -hmm. Do you need my file? And costing it from the beginning. Mm -hmm. um, if you can Google Magistrates Court versus right. the K Branson Design, you can get a really good case study of what not to do. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but the I think that majority of... Um, majority of designers we're working with now are happy to hand over their files as long as they're compensated for them. Right. And in terms of valuing that, do you guys have any thoughts on, on that? Yeah. If you, if you take a look at what the job initially cost, 
Yeah. So, and, and the case Carol's just referred to was in fact an annual report where, where that organisation asked for the file to do some minor changes and subsequently used it the following year to cut out using Carol. Um, and so if you look at it from that context, you say, all right, well, that, that uh, the basis of that report, perhaps all the styles in it, were usable again for the next year or maybe the year after. Yeah. So you would be inclined to say, um, I want uh, the design fee again because you've cut me out of my design fee uh, mm -hmm. if you're going to reuse it and uh, um, the time it would have saved in terms of artwork. So yeah. I, would, I would be inclined to say the fee is double um, what you paid. So twice the design fee and twice the artwork fee, mm -hmm. uh, which fits with uh, a lot of illustrators work that way. They say if you want uh, ownership of the illustration, um, itself, um, rather than the usage rights, yep. uh, you will pay double. Yep. Um, so it seems to be an accepted uh, way it's of operating. Royalty. Yeah, it's a royalty. Mm -hmm. And I think that's a fair sort of uh, figure. Um, it's then up to the client to determine whether they can actually recoup that much out of reusing it themselves. But I think that's where the and, figure is. And the time is. saving. Yeah. That usually for a client, that's a, that's, it's valuable because that it's going totally. to save them so much time. Mm -hmm. Totally. Mm -hmm. and yeah, I think it just maximizes the opportunity to uh, to capitalize on the value that you can offer. Um, but yeah, as you said, you know, it is in the client's interest interest as well. At the end of the day, it's a matter of communicating that. Um, and there was mm -hmm. something else that we talked about yesterday that I'm interested for you guys to maybe maybe just chat about briefly before we do take some questions, and that was around in terms of you know maximizing opportunities when it comes to winning new work, um, not proposing just one price to a client, but proposing multiple options to a client, different, different a range of services that you can offer mm. that do kind of you know, embrace, I, I suppose, entail different levels of work and effort and deliverables. Um, do you want to talk about that? Yeah, um, many, many studios are doing this nowadays where they have a good, better, best uh, estimate and the good will do the job and deliver the basics of really what the client wants. Minimum viable. Yeah, products. it's the minimum viable offer that you can put together. Um, mm -hmm. The the better is going to have some extra elements to it that give uh, a better chance of success for yeah. for it or a greater level of penetration into a market. And the best is going to have some some perhaps it's got a lot more research going in in the first place and the research itself is very useful for the client apart from this job so uh, you would beef up the the research and strategy end of it in the best so that's happening a lot now um, uh, where clients are being offered that um, my experience is you get a lot of clients who choose the middle option uh, they can see the, the the good will work but they can see a good proposal in the middle offer um, and so I, I think it's a it's a, a really good way to go because um, it if the client says well look I'd love to do the best but I haven't got the budget at least what you've done is introduce them to the idea that you offer other services mm. I, I think it's also really valid because many clients now are asking for ballpark figures Mm. You've got the chicken and the egg thing. Can you, mm. give me a, can you give me a budget? Can you tell me what you can do? Can you give me, I need a budget. Now you tell me what you can do. Whereas the good, better, best is a perfect way of laying out. Well, if you've got, I can cut the cloth to fit. I can do this minimum product, but I can also do the bells and whistles at the other yeah. end and I can yeah. do something in between. It's yeah. enough information. You're not taking so much time to cost yeah. it, um, that it it's ends up a, um, difficult for the studio. You can yeah. get it out there and the client can go to their client and say, this is the kind of budget we want, this is what we can get from it. Totally. I think it's really important because it does demonstrate that your work exists on a spectrum um, based on what the mm -hmm. client's needs are and the deliverables. And I think it also indicates that you understand or that you have the opportunity to really understand the client's 
problem or what they're what they're needing as well. Yeah. So the fact that you've presented three options already demonstrates that you're engaging with what the client's asking, yeah. and you're already thinking about what what you're what you can offer to them um, mm. as opposed to giving them one number, one option, and saying, mm. "Hey, this is what we do." That's um, a really good point because in the um, research that we often quote, I often quote that what clients think survey that was done in the UK, 100 studios paid a third party to survey 500 of their clients to ask them what um, what clients liked or didn't like about the relationship with designers. And one of the things that came across really strongly was clients wanted designers to be proactive. They wanted them to understand their business and mm. to um, come up with ideas where design could help their business profit. Yeah. That would be a perfect way by saying, yep, you've asked me to do X, but really if you added this in or did a little bit more research or we didn't just do a publication, we did a video, yeah. then the outcome would be this. Yeah, absolutely. That's awesome. Um, I I think think I'm, I'm, sorry, I see on one of the questions there, Adam, yeah, yeah. I don't know whether... Um, the question came through after the explanation, but but just to recap on the whole thing about uh, how you you cost out your source files, um, the, the the really blunt rule of thumb is you double uh, what your design and artwork fee would have been, and that that's the price you would quote. Uh, the the complexity comes in. So I know I work with quite a few uh, agencies who do FMCG where it's typical nowadays that they'll ask uh, for one pack design from the designer, um, they'll take it in-house and then they've got a group of people who are very competent at rolling out uh, iterations of that design. Um, and in an instance like that, if I, I would be saying, well, how many SKUs are you going to put this to? And if they say 10, what I'd be doing is estimating what the 10 was going to cost me in terms of time which is going to be less than what I would have charged them. Um, so I, I would then be going back with that figure and I'd say, well, you know, really that's that's going to save you uh, 15 hours of artwork with us. Um, we would normally charge, uh, cost that at $100 an hour. So that source file is worth the initial estimate plus $1,500 in that instance. So you've, you've there's some very, as I said, blunt ways of doing it, but there's also some more scientific ways of working it out. Awesome. Um, I think that's a great place to leave it. Um, I think we've covered heaps of ground there and thanks Adam for dropping that last question in and Greg explaining it. Uh, I don't think there were any other questions that were directed uh, towards uh, Carol or Greg that I could pick up, but there was quite a bit in there it all looked to be based around how those phases are working, which often happens the day we release something new, people aren't too sure how they're working or what they're meant to do with it. Um, uh, so thanks, Sarah, for jumping in and uh, clarifying a bit there. But if anyone did have some final questions before Carol and Greg leave us, then I'll let them drop in uh, over the next minute. But I did want to as well just share some a couple of links here. Um, there's design. Business Council at the top there, where you can find Carol and Greg and the work that they do, which is fantastic, doing awesome work for the industry. Streamtime.net, that's us. So if you've come through Greg and Carol's mm -hmm. uh, channels and you haven't checked out Streamtime before, that's how you can find out more about us and get in touch if you want to chat and set up a time to explore how Streamtime might work, then we're certainly open to it. Just let us know. And Never Not Creative as well, which is the group that, or the community that Andy, Andy Wright has um, created and is working hard at. They've recently just launched a mentally healthy uh, um, change group as well. So they're interested in looking at mental health within the industry and actually working towards improving that. Uh, they ran a survey last year, which um, brought in a lot of results, which were quite concerning and and um, spurred on the work that they're doing there, which is great. But Never Not Creative doesn't just talk about uh, doesn't just talk about mental health. It talks about a whole range of things, um, burnout within that, and also just valuing creativity and how creativity and design is especially valued within the industry. And communicating that value is a large part of that conversation as well. So it's entirely relevant to what we've been talking about mm. today. Very. Um, yeah. 
And um, can I just add in there that um, one of the things I'm working with with Never Not Creative is around yes. interns and yes, really trying to clarify how interns are used. And we've got a survey out at the moment. So if um, may, I'm not positive where the link is for that, but if someone um, gets in contact with me, I can give them the link or can you... I think on. through Never Not, Never Not Creative's website does right. have an internship section, I'm fairly sure. Yeah, that'd be great because we're trying to do some more research into what what recent graduates want from an internship and okay. what does... the um, So 85% of all studios are five pe people or less where there's a plethora of micro-businesses out there. So what can we do for a micro business to help them take on an intern? Mm -hmm. Are there guidelines, are there procedures? You know, what what can I give you? Well, how can I help you take on an intern? So if um, the more people that do that survey at the beginning while we're in the research phase, the better it will be. Totally, and another great place, um, if you're interested in Never Not Creative, is the Never Not Creative Facebook group, which yeah, is right. really, really active as well. So that'll be the best place for you guys. I'll just drop the link to that one in the top here as well. Oh. Terrific. Um, but that yeah. is where a lot of the active conversation is happening. So you can head over there, join the group, see what we're talking about, and um, that's the best way to kind of get involved as well. Have a direct look. If I can else. just add this whole discussion we're having nowadays about the um, uh, the stress that's been created in studios and the impact it's having on people. Um, it's, and it's been around for a long time, uh, that mm. the whole idea that, you know, if you're not there at nine o'clock at night, you're not committed. Um, yeah. That sort of attitude, which is uh, thankfully breaking down. But the interesting thing about that is you, you can actually fix a lot of that by just going back to things like pricing. That, that, you know, the question is, why do you have to work such long hours to maintain yeah. your business? It's probably yeah. because your pricing is not right or right. you're looking for margins that are just ridiculous. Yeah. Um, um, or, as Carol started out saying, you haven't chunked down the, the project into enough discrete units that you can manage in a, in a reasonable time frame. So the, the uh, stress and, and mental health is very much related to the way uh, the owner sets up and runs uh, that side of their business. Mm. And there's that link between burnout and yeah. exhaustion, yeah. That um, a recent survey. Mm. But we could keep talking for hours. Yes, <laughs> we, we certainly could. Thanks so much, um, Greg right. and Carl, for, for your insights there, your wisdom and um, all your knowledge. It's invaluable and it's... Uh, we're so lucky to be able to have you guys, um, you know, so so closely involved with us and um, to be able to share this with everyone who's rocked up today. We had about 50 people in, so um, few numbers, which is great. I'm sure as everyone's, you know, already made it pretty evident, um, everyone's been really engaged and got plenty to take away. So again, thanks everyone for tuning in. Thanks, Greg and Carol, and we'll see you next week. Okay. Terrific. See you. All right. Bye. See you later. Bye. -bye. Bye, -bye.